So good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us to learn about the redistricting that's going to take place as a result of the 2020 census. We're really fortunate to have Jeffrey Weiss, an adjunct professor and senior fellow at New York Law School, where he directs the New York Census and Redistricting Institute. And he is here to explain the impact of the latest census and the implications of it. He is now in the process of working on his fifth redistricting cycle, yet remains so young. How, how he does it, we don't know. He served as a redistricting council to five state assembly speakers and four state Senate Democratic leaders in past years. He currently serves as counsel to the state's assemblies, state assemblies redistricting chair. He's the co-editor and author of the National Conference of State Legislators recently published 2020 redistricting red book a comprehensive handbook on the census and redistricting processes he also served as counsel to numerous state and local governments across new york and the nation so welcome jeff thank you for being here and i'm going to turn it over to you okay well uh thank you very much and good morning it's a pleasure to uh, uh visit north of albany uh, for a few minutes and discuss the uh, redistricting process that will be taking place uh, throughout the um, this year and into early next year, followed by uh, county, town, and city redistricting. So uh, I'm going to bring up a PowerPoint to walk you through the process. So let me share my screen. Okay. All right. So um, here you see a puzzle, and hopefully uh, a half hour from now, this puzzle won't be as puzzling. Some of this might make some sense to you, and I'll do my best to uh, try to well, play it out uh, so you understand what redistricting is, why it's important, what it does, but most importantly, the process, uh, how it will um, play out between now and January, and finish up with some local numbers on what to expect, and a few ideas on how to get involved. So first thing we look at is why does this matter? Um, what, what is redistricting all about? Uh, it emanates from the census. It's about dollars and power. Uh, New York State receives billions of dollars from Washington for programs, including healthcare, transportation, education, senior services, you name it. There are over 300 federal programs that are driven by uh, census population driven numbers. Uh, although very few of the programs are based on a per capita or per person basis for 16 major programs alone based on per capita funding, uh, New York received $53 billion. That breaks down to uh, $2,687 per person for just 16 programs alone. I just want to emphasize 16 programs because people often see the first number and they say, oh, the census benefits us by you know, $2,600 per person. Uh, it actually benefits everybody by uh, thousands and thousands more. Uh, when we look at the other side of why the census is important and the reason why the census is taken from the very beginning in the 1790s, uh, congressional reapportionment or the allocation of congressional districts among the 50 states. Uh, during World War II, New York State had 45 members in the U.S. House of Representatives. Today, in 2021, New York has only 27 members in the House. That's the same number the state had in the 1820s. So you can see that New York went from uh, a, a relatively small number for a large state uh, 200 years ago, uh, up to 45 members in the middle of the last century. Um, but now at 27, we're going to lose one district as a result of last year's census, and we'll, we'll be down to 26 districts. Uh, just to give you an idea, this is these are New York City maps, but uh, congressional districts are comprised of right now of about 717,000 people. Uh, state Senate districts are smaller. They have about 320,000 people each, 
and state assembly districts of which there are 150 in the state have about 130,000 people each. So where are we today? How did we get here um, and what's happened? Uh, well, because of the pandemic, the census process was delayed, uh, delayed considerably. Uh, the census should have been in full swing in April, April 2020, but things shut down in the middle of March. So the census count had to be extended uh, to go from April uh, to July instead to get things underway all the way through October. And of course, you may have heard about Donald Trump's efforts to adjust the census numbers by uh, adding a last minute citizenship question to the census. Uh, the president claimed that they needed more citizenship information to enforce the Federal Voting Rights Act. But the Supreme Court and other courts discovered that was just a pretext for uh, trying to suppress the count uh, and they didn't cross their T's, they didn't uh, dot their I's to add a question properly because the question was not unconstitutional per se, they just botched up trying to add the, the question. But that caused a lot of delay. It, it, it threw a chilling effect over the census on people who didn't want to respond to the government, didn't want to respond about anything relating to citizenship. Uh, and that the, uh, the, you know, the pandemic delays are now delaying the data delivery, uh, which is going to now create, and we'll see this in New York, a rather expedited redistricting schedule in New York and many other states. So just a few terms, phrases, things you need to pick up on. Um, reapportionment, as I said, is the simple reallocation of congressional districts across the country among the 50 states. It's driven by a 1940s era formula that after assigning one district per state, uh, districts 51 to 435 are apportioned based on an algorithmic formula. Uh, New York, as we learned, was short of retaining its 27th district by 89 people. That's not to say that you freeze the rest of the country and simply add 89 people to New York. It's a much bigger dynamic than that because you'd have to upset the whole 50 state apple cart, but it hurts that New York could have kept a 27th district by 89 people. Uh, redistricting is the next step. Redistricting is the actual line drawing process where district boundaries for Congress, the state Senate, assembly, uh, county legislatures, town boards, city councils are all redrawn to meet population equality requirements uh, found in the U.S. Constitution and state constitutions and other, other um, legal doc documents. Uh, we're going to be receiving the redistricting data August 16th, and that's the data that's um, I'll, it's referred to as PL94171 data. Uh, it, it includes by race, by age, and by ethnicity, population information down to the block level. A block is like a city block or an election district, a rather small area. Uh, the data that comes in August, this is something the newspapers have been covering, will be in raw form. You have to have some expertise to be able to read it, but the same data will also be made available September 30th in a much more user-friendly um, basis. Don't fret over that. August 16th is the date to expect the data. Now, uh, as I mentioned, we see here this, the size based on the 2010 census of our congressional, state Senate, and assembly districts. While the uh, congressional district delegation size will decrease, the state Senate will stay at 63 districts and in the state assembly, 150 districts. Now, one of the most confusing things in redistricting law to be aware of is that the courts have decided, the Supreme Court has decided that for congressional districts, each district must be exactly equal in population to each other within a state. That's why in New York, each congressional district is literally within about one person of 700 Thousand seven um, seven hundred and seventeen thousand people uh, in the state senate, state assembly, 
at your uh, city councils and town boards where redistricting is required. You're allowed to differ in the population um, size, the differences. You're allowed to stretch the population differences, or we call it deviation, up to 10%. That could be plus five, minus five, plus seven, minus three, using the mean population number. And here you see for 2010, the mean numbers are for Congress, Assembly, and Senate, 717, 310, or 130. That's the key thing to remember because you'll see later some of the numbers that will explain how they're going to change when the line drawing process starts. And again, uh, here we have three basic laws that uh, control uh, direct redistricting in New York. We have, of course, the Const U.S. Constitution's one person, one vote requirement that emanates from the 14th Amendment uh, due process clause and requires that each district be relatively the same size and population as all the others. It's one person, one vote. It's the um, uh, principle that was set down first by the US Supreme Court, beginning with the case of Baker versus Carr in 1962. Prior to the 1960s, some states didn't redraw their district lines ever. And in fact, in New York state, under the 1894 constitution, each county in New York had at least one assembly district, regardless of population. That ended 50 plus years ago. Uh, the second major law is the Federal Voting Rights Act. And that requires that in communities with high levels of racially polarized voting, meaning that you have a, uh, a white majority voting population that denies the minority community its ability to elect their preferred candidates of choice. Uh, if you sh can show that the minority community can consist of at least 50% of its voting age population, 18 and over, uh, then you may be required to create a certain kind of a uh, minority-based district. Then the third uh, law is the New York State Constitution, which I'll be spending most of my time on. Uh, the state constitution was amended by voters through an amendment approved in 2014 that for the first time sets up an advisory commission to advise the legislature on uh, what lines to accept for Congress and the Assembly and the Senate. Um, under state law, those lines are changed through a simple state law that has to pass through both chambers in Albany and that the governor has to approve. Although today, uh, the governor, if he vetoes a plan, could be overridden because the Democrats have over two thirds or a supermajority in both chambers. Uh, the tools, I uh, just repeat the PL94171 gives you the block level data by race, age, and ethnicity. Um, vendors sell high speed software that lets you take the cursor to um, the map, move around the screen and your boundaries change geographically and the numbers change alongside. You get a sense of how your populations are moving to meet the population equality requirements. In terms of who does this at the staff level, the legislature has always used its own internal office called LATFOR, the Legislative Advisory Task Force on Reapportionment uh, to um, draw the lines and LATFOR still exists. Uh, and you also have the New York State Commission, uh, which uh, is just be getting underway um, this month. And I'll be spending some time on that, I think probably beginning in my next slide. Yes, uh, we have now a 10 member commission. On paper, it's called the New York Independent Redistricting Commission. It's independent in the sense that uh, the legislature itself doesn't get involved in the line drawing process, despite the fact that eight of the 10 members were appointed by the state legislative leaders and that the legislature has final say over the plan. So that really doesn't make it independent, but on paper, um, it's called independent. And these are the, uh, the four commission members appointed by uh, the Democratic Assembly Speaker and the Democratic Senate president. 
Uh, one is from the Albany area, Elaine Frazier, who uh, lives in Albany and has been a longtime state employee. On the minority side, the Republicans have appointed four seasoned veteran legis former legislators. Um, you see their names here. And these eight members then picked two independent members, independent in that they can't be members of the state's largest two political parties. So we have 10 members altogether. Uh, it's important to note that there is no tie-breaking chair so that a 10-member commission can easily uh, split 5-5. Five, five. And we've seen that happen because the 10 commissioners are supposed to select one member to serve as chair, but they've been deadlocked so far, 4-4, four, four, along with each independent siding with either the Democrats or Republicans. Uh, the legislature recently appropriated $4 million for the commission to operate through next year. And the commission has selected two co-executive directors, one Democrat, one Republican, as required by the uh, Constitution. Uh, the criteria, the principles that the commission has to follow in developing their plans include the top two federal criteria, population equality from the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution and the Federal Voting Rights Act. Um, additional state criteria has been added uh, that requires that districts be compact, that they be roughly round or square, rectangular, but not uh, or, or, you know, be shaped like a Rorschach test of 50 or 100 different sides to it. Uh, districts have to be contiguous, meaning that you can travel from one part of the district to another and not leave the district, that, all, that the district should be contiguous to itself, that you don't have to leave it or travel or walk across water. You can connect a body of water uh, by bridge, by ferry, or by tunnel. And that we see happening in New York City out of necessity to get the numbers to add up, where you might use a bridge or a ferry to uh, connect districts. Uh, we also have criteria to keep communities of interest intact. And a community of interest is a self-defined socioeconomic, racial, ethnic community that uh, residents believe they have commonality with each other. It could be a you know, village A and village B together as a community of interest, but um, that's an emerging area of the law. Uh, the Constitution also requires that jurisdictional boundaries be followed, that you minimize splits amongst cities, towns, villages, and counties, uh, that uh, the Constitution suggests that incumbents not be paired, and last, that there be partisan fairness, that no plan should um, advantage or disadvantage any one particular political party. These are all very um, idealistic criteria. You might not be able to meet all of them. Uh, they're not prioritized or ranked in any, any particular order, although Population Equality and Voting Rights Act compliance, which are federal requirements, of course, would preempt anything the state would have. Uh, so this is where things get a little bit tricky. Uh, how will the process work? Uh, first off, the commission is late in getting organized uh, through some differences with uh, how the commission would get funded. They're just yet getting their money from the state controller. But once they get up and running, which means they'll have an email address, they'll have uh, a telephone number, a mailing address. They have none of that so far, today being middle of May. Uh, but they are supposed to undertake a robust public outreach effort to uh, explain the process. Uh, we have a head start on that, uh, given that we're doing this uh, webinar today. Uh, the commission has to follow the special criteria that I outlined, and then the process gets a little bit complicated. Uh, the commission is tasked with being able to submit up to two different sets of map plans to the state legislature for Congress and the legislature itself. On the first round, the legislature can accept the maps, can reject them. Uh, on a second, if they're rejected, uh, same thing over again on a second round that the legislature can accept the maps sent to the governor for approval. Uh, but if the second set of maps is rejected, then the legislature can develop its own plans in a third round. Of course, the governor must approve or veto plans and the new plans will be in place for next year's elections. 
Now we already looked at uh, the dates. We have the uh, the granular block data coming August 16th. Uh, the commission will have three or four months to develop its plans with data down from the nine months that they should have had if the census data arrived in April when it usually would have had it not been for the pandemic. Uh, the commission must make its draft plans, data, other information available at least 30 days before its first public hearing. And that map is supposed to come out September 15th or soon after. Uh, the commission hasn't um, met to the point of knowing if they'll have a plan by September 15th. And it's also always an open question whether the commission can agree on a plan um, at all, but we'll find that out. But once they have their first plan, uh, they're required, according to the constitution, to go out and hold at least 12 hearings throughout the state. Those 12 hearings are in specified counties uh, in Erie, in um, Monroe, Onondaga, Albany, the five boroughs of New York City, Rockland, Nassau, Suffolk. Uh, but the commission has also talked about the need to cover two areas that were not in the constitution, uh, the North Country and the Southern Tier, and they do expect to hold hearings there. In 2011, uh, the legislature did hold hearings in Plattsburgh. Uh, of course, there'll be hearings in, in Albany. Uh, and the commission has talked about uh, having preliminary outreach hearings in June and July before the data comes, just to get a sense of what people are thinking about. Uh, now, the commission voting systems are a bit complicated. Uh, right now, with the legislature controlled by the Democrats, uh, you need to have at least one appointee from each of the four legislative leaders to approve any MAP proposal. Uh, you need seven members to um, report, move forward a plan with four of those votes coming at least from one of each of the four partisan appointees. And if the commission cannot get seven members to agree on a plan, uh, the plan or plans with the greatest number of votes can be submitted to the legislature along with the vote totals. Now, we are, you are going to be asked as voters this November to approve a new constitutional amendment that will change some of these rules. Uh, because the amendment that we're operating under now was drafted in 2012, and approved in 2014, New York then had a fall September primary. In 2019, the primary was moved to June, uh, which means that petitioning for um, office needs to start in late February or in early March. So the deadlines uh, are being changed as well as some of the rules on how to get plans out of the commission. And I'm, cover these in a moment. Uh, so the commission under current law uh, can submit its first set of plans to the legislature by January 1st of next year. And it has a grace period to go as late as January 15th if necessary. Uh, the pending amendment sets the first deadline as a, a hard end of January 1st with no grace period. Then, as I mentioned before, the legislature has the option, uh, well, the legislature must approve the first plan without amendments uh, and send it to the governor for approval. Uh, the legislature can also include the congressional plan in the same bill with the assembly and the Senate. Usually in the past, they were considered as separate bills by, these, by the legislature. Uh, again, if the legislature rejects the first plan or if the governor vetoes it, uh, the commission must submit a second set of plans under current law no later than February 28th of next year. Uh, but as I mentioned, we have primary petitioning starting in late February. So the February 28th deadline for second plan really wouldn't work unless the primary uh, is moved to a later point next year. And I've seen no appetite for that. Uh, so the, the deadline for the second plan, if the first is rejected, is now going to be January 15th under the pending constitutional amendment. And then if the second plan is rejected by the legislature or vetoed by the governor, then the legislature can amend the plan, really create a plan 
uh, as the Constitution says, as it deems necessary, which essentially means, bottom line, the legislature on a third round can draw its own map as it had in the past. Uh, I'll just mention, even though the legislature can now override a gubernatorial veto, no governor has vetoed a redistricting plan since Franklin Roosevelt in 1931. Uh, now, in the Assembly and the Senate, the votes also um, depend on who controls the legislature, similar to who controls the legislature on the votes in the Commission on requiring at least one of the four um, legislative leader appointees to approve a plan. Under current law, if one party controls both chambers, as we have now, at least two thirds of the members of each chamber must vote to approve a plan. Um, if the chambers had divided control as the state has had for many decades prior to 2018 with a majority Democratic Assembly and a majority uh, Republican State Senate, then you simply had to have a majority of the legislators elected to each chamber voting to approve a plan. But the proposed constitutional amendment uh, will be, would be changed um, simply uh, allowing a simple majority in both chambers to pass a plan regardless of who controls the, um, uh, the chambers. Uh, the amendment that was passed in 2014 also provides for um, a challenge to the plan by any citizen uh, by going to state Supreme Court. Uh, what's new is that the state Supreme Court only has 60 days to uh, rule on a plan. Uh, those decisions could, of course, be appealed to the appellate division and the state court of appeals. There are no time frames there. And should any court invalidate the redistricting plan, the legislature itself, not the commission, uh, would make the remedial changes to fix the plan up, depending on what the court thinks uh, was wrong with it. Uh, let's see. Um, now, one thing that was left out of the 2014 amendment was a 2010 state law that reallocates prisoners from their prison um, locations where they're counted in the census back to their homes of record prior to incarceration. This is known as prison gerrymandering, where prisoners are used to fill up the populations of districts, basically rural districts, where those prisoners really aren't living or participating in community activity. They're filling in district populations uh, this was seen as a major civil rights issue. So in 2010, for the redistricting for the Assembly and the Senate, uh, prisoners, about 30,000 plus in New York, were um, reallocated from their prison facility locations back to their homes of record if they were known before incarceration. And the pending constitutional amendment would also put that statute into the Constitution itself. Uh, there was some concern that the commission might not be required to follow um, you know, the state law because it wasn't included in the higher law, that being the Constitution itself. Uh, the pending amendment also makes changes uh, rather than have a requirement of four appointees from the political leaders voting for a plan, you simply need any seven commission members to approve a plan. Again, it sets January 1st as the deadline for the commission's first set of plans, and if rejected, sets January 15th as the deadline for the commission's second set of plans. And to approve a commission plan, uh, simple majorities are needed in the Senate and Assembly, uh, not two thirds. But slight twist, if the commission fails to develop a plan, then you have to have at least 60% of the vote in each of the Assembly and the Senate. But um, the Democrats now have well over 60%. Uh, the amendment also sets the size of the Senate at 63 districts, uh, reason being that in the last four redistricting cycles, the state Senate added one district each decade to compensate for population losses upstate and population shifts more towards downstate and cities. Uh, the amendment also eliminates the partisan co-executive directors. And of course, as I mentioned in the last slide, it ends the prison gerrymandering uh, 
process. And by the numbers, I'll get a little bit local here uh, and I'll explain what these numbers mean. Uh, the Census Bureau every year issues uh, projections at the state and county level. The projections uh, we think might have been very, very low for the last few years because from 2010 to 2016, New York gained population, yet by the projections in 2017, 18, and 19, New York lost population because all of the state's new growth came from foreign immigrants. And when the Trump administration closed the door to uh, immigration in 2017, the state began shrinking. But the state population that came out on April 26, the hard count population based on the 2020 census, had New York actually increasing over a 10 year period by 4%. We don't quite yet understand why or what happened, but we will have a better sense when the granular data comes out in August, where we could see at the local level, uh, how the projections matched up to you know, your village, your, your town, your community. But when you look at the state's population total from the 2020 census, and you look at the projections uh, there are wide disparities in terms of how many people are needed to fill up the new districts to be drawn this year. Now, under the state's new population of 20 some odd million people, uh, the new congressional mean population for each district will go up from uh, 700,000, uh, 717 up to 748,213. Senate districts will increase by about uh, a few thousand people to 320,000 each, and assembly districts will increase to about 134,674 people each. Now the congressional districts, each congressional district in New York State must be at the new number of 748,213 plus or minus one person per district. The Senate and Assembly districts can vary by up to 10%. So be mindful as I discuss these numbers here that for congressional districts 20 and 21, while the new district population totals must be 748,213, we're losing a congressional district someplace in New York and no one knows where that will be probably until the end of the year, either if the commission agrees on how to eliminate one district or the legislature does. But uh, it's hard to factor in where that loss would be with the numbers. But right now, Congressional District 20 uh, is estimated to include 725,559 people. That's 22,550 people short of a district, or it's about 3% below a district's average size and each district must be a zero deviation. So that district needs to pick up a few thousand people. It's not that significant a number. However, District 21, which is now estimated to include 694,835 people uh, is underpopulated by over 53,000 people or about a 7% um, you know, population um, um, gap. And then you'll see similarly for Senate districts 43 and 45, you'll see the new projected estimates and how many people those districts are below the mean average population for a Senate district. But again, unlike Congress, there's wiggle room in how you draw these districts. And again, for the assembly, I used two examples here, districts 114 and 118. Uh, they're both um, underpopulated, although District 114 is only you know, 2,200 people short of a district, uh, while District 118 is 6,823 people short of a district. Uh, in August, we'll have a much better sense of how many people are really under or over the new average uh, district population. But right now, for ballpark purposes, uh, the districts locally north of Albany need to pick up a lot of people. Uh, what you can do in the process is you know, learn about the process, 
Today's uh, webinar is one example of a way to you know, learn about this process. Uh, once the commission has its uh, website, its phone number, its email address, you follow the commission's work, you can testify before the commission, you can write to the commission, you can send letters to newspapers about redistricting, uh, and you can hold informational meetings of your own uh, about the redistricting process. Uh, I'm going to skip New York City Council, uh, but if you'd like to get in touch with me with more information, uh, here's my email address, and I'd be delighted to answer any questions people might have. So with that, I will end and go back to uh, the live video. And there is no quiz now asking you what I just described. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeff. That was fascinating and terrifying and concerning all at once. So, <laughs> Kathy, please feel free to ask any questions. I'm wondering what should our, um, what's the impact for public libraries? What should we be thinking about and how should we be preparing for this? Well, you know, one thing for the libraries themselves is to look at your delivery areas uh, where, where your uh, your readers um, you know um, come from, uh, libraries themselves don't usually get involved in advocating for or against district lines. But uh, when you look at how you're funded through Washington to make sure that who represents you in Washington or who represents you in Albany or in your city councils, uh, re you know reflect your readership areas. This is probably more of something that, um, you know, that your readers will take it upon themselves to make those determinations. Do you want to be represented in Albany by three state legislators in the assembly and Senate, or uh, do you want just one? I know in, um, in the North country along the Canadian border, uh, there are a few counties that don't have a single legislator living in their counties, yet they're divided <clears throat> into three or four assembly or Senate districts. So you, know, you look at it, well, do you wanna stay this way or should we be joined together? But you have to balance that against population equality needs where it's harder to draw, you can't draw single county districts because <clears throat> several of the counties are simply too small to sustain one district, which is why it's important to look at the numbers and learn the process. Yeah, seeing how <clears throat> the population we lost in our districts was, um, I guess I maybe had thought some of that, but I hadn't anticipated that significant of a drop. Yeah, but just keep in mind also that the Census Bureau's estimates might have been too low. Oh, okay. We don't, that's the missing link that we don't know if the Census Bureau was accurate in, in the estimates they produced in the latter part of the decade. So we'll have a better sense once the August 16th data comes out. Right. And when we say August 16th, it might actually be another week until yeah. the data is actually unpacked and you know, analyzed. That we'd heard from the Census Office, too, we could expect... Um, better numbers in September. So that's kind of what we've been. Well, September, the same data that comes out in September will be out in August is simply that the August data will more or less give you a suitcase full of data unsorted. And in September, it'll be sorted and figured out that you can read it in a much more easier user friendly, friendly format. I actually do have a question, Erica. <coughs> so <Hooray. laughs> um, we're a special library district and the three communities that pay into our tax district are um, ones in Saratoga County and two are in Warren County. As the redistricting trickles down to community levels, perhaps, do you think, well, would we be obligated to reassess our legislation and or bylaws for proportionality of representation on our board right now it's you know proportional to population size and then there's you know no no fewer than indicators and in are that. the board members elected by popular election yes yeah, that's a good question because school boards are now becoming more and more subject to redistricting if they are um, electing members in a way that 
don't provide equal population balance. Mm -hmm. And that's similar to how several counties have uh, multi-member or weighted voting systems that essentially you want to ensure that all the members, if they're elected by the public, are um, electing. Do we just lose something happened here on my screen? Uh, okay, I'm back. Uh, that you want to make sure that each board member is elected on the same basis, people-wise, as all of the others. Mm -hmm. There actually, to my knowledge, haven't been challenges to library boards against that. Last year in Rockland County, there was a challenge to the school board in East Ramapo, and a federal court ruled that because there was a significant uh, minority population that was not able to elect members fairly, uh, that it was found in violation of the Voting Rights Act. But it's a good question on library boards, and we're just looking now into school districts. So I'll keep that in mind as we explore later this year on what is a, I, I deal with a, a friend at SUNY New Paltz that um, has done a lot of the work at the school board level. So we, we will follow up on that. It's a good point. I appreciate it, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for thinking of that. Any other questions, Kathy? It's complicated. <laughs> I know my head's kind of like. <laughs> well, you know the uh, the 2014 amendment was quite complex. It doesn't read very easily. If you sat down to read it, you'll get a headache. It was written not in consequential order. So I tried to spell it out to go over the commission, the principles, the deadlines, and the differences between the commission voting process and the legislative voting process. And it was all drawn up basically uh, by the Republican majority in the Senate in 2012, where they never ever thought they'd lose the majority, which overwhelmingly happened in 2018 and 20, where I, I worked for the Senate Democrats in 2012, and no one ever thought they'd have a supermajority by 2021. Well, there so. you go. <laughs> Let that be a lesson when you're thinking about trying to, uh, you know, um, yeah, also, you know, no other section in state law references partisan type votes, except for this redistricting section, which is why in large part the pending amendment uh, takes the politics out of the process. But mm -hmm. it was it was put in there to ensure that if the Republicans ever went into the minority, they would have a controlling voice. People disagree over whether that's good or bad, but I just laid it out for you objectively as best I could. Yeah, no, thank you. It's, it's interesting to see all this. Well, thank you so much. You've certainly given me okay, a lot to pleasure. think about yeah. and, and unpack, then, and I'm sure I'll be watching okay. the recording multiple times to okay, wrap my head you. around this. Thank you. <laughs> okay, bye. Thank you both. Thanks, Erica.